Good afternoon. And thank you for joining us for the Affordable Housing and Economic Development Rural Approach webinar. I'm David Lipset, CEO of Housing Assistance Council, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit that helps build homes and communities across rural America. Since 1971, we have been providing local organizations with the technical assistance, affordable loans, and overall capacity building that they need to help rural communities and lower income families prosper. We do this work with a broad array of public and private partners, including IEDC member organizations across the rural US. Housing Assistance Council, we often call ourselves HAC, is also the nation's foremost source of information and research on rural housing. We're based here in DC so that we can work to inform federal uh, housing policy, inform federal programs, and maintain a community of rural practitioners who share our interest in rural development. Please make use of our data portal, our original research and industry reports that HAC makes available all for free online at ruralhome.org. When you're there, you can sign up for our newsletters, magazines, online content, and mark your calendars to attend the National Rural Housing Conference in DC on December 5th. So on with the show. Joining us today are two experts who will share insight into how your organization can use affordable housing to support economic development in rural communities. Before we begin, I would like to share a few housekeeping notes from IEDC. Please note that all attendees will be muted during the webinar. To ask questions of the speakers, please type your questions into the question box. During the Q&A period at the end of the session, I'll pose your questions to the panelists. Within 24 hours of today's webinar, an evaluation will be emailed to you by IEDC. Please complete the evaluation as they do use your feedback to improve web seminars. At the end of the evaluation, you will receive a link to download today's presentation. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. Beginning with Kelly Hutton Dutmeyer, based in Iowa, Kelly is the executive director of the East Central Intergovernmental Association. You guys probably know them as ECIA. ECIA is a council of governments and provides technical assistance in the areas of economic development, housing, employment and training, transportation and land use planning, community development, and transit to more than 70 municipalities in a five county region of Dubuque, Delaware, Jackson, Cedar, and Clinton counties in rural Iowa. As executive director, Kelly develops and directs the programs, services and administers affairs of ECIA, carries out organizational and policy matters, oversees all agency-wide programs, services and staff, and maintains liaison with member agencies as well as the national, state, and other local agencies and officials she works with. In other words, Kelly does it all. Prior to becoming executive director, Kelly was assistant director for housing at ECA. Kelly's other professional experience includes holding the positions of director of grant proposals at Clark College in Dubuque. And while residing in Wisconsin for several years, she was a director of housing community development for a community action agency. Kelly, we're thrilled to have you here today. Without further delay, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. And welcome, everyone. I look forward to this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk today about housing in Iowa and a couple of projects that we have done that potentially you could, you could repl replicate in your area. Uh, a little bit more about uh, ECIA. Um, ECIA, where we're located, um, I've got a map there for you that shows that we're uh, on the Mississippi River and we border Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, we cover five counties. Our population is about 200,000 and our largest community is City Dubuque, which is about 60,000. Um, our Council of Governments are really, were created for, to provide collaboration, efficiency and services, to share resources, to act as that liaison between um, federal, state, and local funding, uh, and really to provide um, provide str strengthening our communities. Um, we're also an extension of city and county staff. That's what we always say when somebody asks us what we do. We say we're an extension of city and county staff. If they can't do it, we try to do it for them. Um, the programs and services David mentioned, um, we do general technical assistance, community development, economic development, and today we're going to focus on housing. 
but we also do employment and training, transportation and planning, transit and community services, and we have about uh, 42 staff here at ECIA. Um, our housing situation in Iowa, I thought I'd give you a little background on that. Um, if you look at what our average housing costs in our five county region uh, for, uh, to purchase a home, it's $128,460. And it just varies by county. Um, our income, Iowa income, and, and when you look at the housing characteristics for Iowa, um, our per capita income in our region um, is about $30,047. Our median household income is about $56,247. 70% um, of our homes in our region are owner-occupied. Uh, if you look at year built, um, the median year built of our homes is 1969, so we do have um, an older housing stock with about 25% built before 1939. Um, what we always encourage our communities to do when we're looking at housing needs, because workforce housing seems to be the demand in our five-county region, and actually it's a demand throughout Iowa, uh, it's hard for us to retain people in Iowa if we don't have uh, somewhere affordable for them to live. But in order for developers, both either private or nonprofit, there's got to be a housing needs assessment done. We've got to know what the demand is. Uh, we need to know what the strengths, the weaknesses, and what the existing assets are within those communities. We have to know what the demographics are. Um, we also have to know how other funding could be leveraged. And then especially, we want to make sure that we know what the vulnerable areas are of the communities because we don't want to build housing and have nobody come. And so a lot of times we have a community that, that says there's a perceived need, but that's not enough. Um, we have to have uh, real data to know what the demand is. So our, our counties um, have all been working on and have been doing housing needs assessment, which uh, we have found out that there is a, a great demand. It's not just perceived, but it is there. Um, so I always talk about planning people in partnerships. Uh, you can't do these projects without people. You can't do them without partnerships, especially in rural areas, and you can't do them without some good planning. And so uh, this is just um, the numerous partners that we have to partner with and that we like to partner with when we are doing uh, housing. And so there are various economic development entities. Uh, our Council of Governments are very active in Iowa, so they're always a great partner. Um, there's actually 17 of our organizations throughout Iowa. Um, private developers, of course, city and county government are critical for our projects. Uh, the USDA um, and then also Federal Home Loan Bank. Uh, we have local housing trust funds here that are very critical to our programs. Working with our utility companies are very important. Uh, our realtors associations have provided some grants for us in the past. Uh, private foundations, our local banks have been very supportive as well as our universities and colleges. So I want to give you some examples of a couple of projects we're doing in Iowa. Um, one of the quotes from our former governor, Tom Vilsack, is about quality and affordable housing is a key element of a strong and secure Iowa. So um, one of the projects we're doing is uh, ourselves as ECIA. Uh, we created a nonprofit for housing development. We actually have a couple of different nonprofits that we've created over the years. One of them was to do uh, USDA uh, housing. Back in the day, it was called Farmer's Home 515 program. Uh, we have a couple of senior citizen sites for that. Um, and then we also did some low-income housing tax credit development through that entity. But we spun off an additional entity um, within the last two years called East Central Development Corporation. And uh, the purpose of that is really to promote and encourage uh, the public welfare, including but not limited to, expanding opportunities in East Central Iowa. And so it's very broad, uh, and that's because we are doing housing, but we're doing different forms of housing. Uh, we're actually doing homeless assistance programs out of there, uh, out of that entity, as well as developing uh, what you'll hear about next is our pocket neighborhood. And so uh, I get a lot of questions about what is a pocket neighborhood. It's, it's not a new concept. It's been around for many years. It's just that it's fairly new in Iowa. Um, it's really about a planned community uh, within a community. It's uh, all around a common green space. Um, I talk about it as it's like when I was a kid and grew up, uh, we grew up in 1,064 square foot houses and we knew our neighbors and we were able to uh, run back and forth across the street and borrow sugar when we needed it to make our cookies. But now we all live in 2,000 to 3,000 square foot houses and we pull into our garage and we don't know what our neighbor does from one day to the next. 
So it's going back to the more simple, affordable uh, building templates, the smaller footprints, um, having an increased sense of ownership uh, and connectivity among the residents. Um, and what we're noticing is this is appealing to all types of buyers. And we also like to incorporate um, some green uh, building concepts in uh, the development. Um, we are working on a project uh, in Makokata, Iowa, which is a community of about uh, 6,000 people. And uh, it's south of Dubuque, which is our most metro city in our region, that's 60,000 people, so it's about a 25-minute commute. Uh, we're building uh, 10 homes. Uh, we're partnering with a local builder. It's 1,064 square feet the homes are, two and three bedroom. Uh, one car garages with second car optional. We're targeting 80% of the county median. Our price point is around 150 to 160,000, uh, less the down payment assistance that we're going to be providing for the buyers. Um, we will be providing $10,000 per home, and we've actually applied for a grant to um, increase that by another 25,000 per home. Uh, we're also doing LED lighting and high efficiency appliances, and we're also readying the homes for solar. Um, the pocket neighborhood, our target market is senior citizens wanting to downsize. Um, in Iowa, we have an aging population. Uh, we have many senior citizens living in big, old two-story homes that are interested in the smaller uh, ranch homes, and so this fits them, as well as young professionals, small families, uh, singles and couples, and also veterans. Currently, I have about 17 people on our waiting list for these 10 homes, and they are really a mixture of um, senior citizens and uh, young families and, and couples. Just to get an idea of the income limits or the populations that we're working with, 80% um, of the county median for a household of three is $48,850 in our region. And uh, this is just an idea of, of the site, and so you get a feel for, if you're not familiar with Iowa, uh, the rural area that we're in. Um, the one of the is an overview is an overview of the site, and then the other one is is looking at it on the site. But the location is very convenient in that it's walkable to a grocery store, it's walkable to um, the pharmacy, it's walkable to McDonald's, it's walkable to restaurants. So uh, again, uh, part of the pocket neighborhood is being within the community uh, and able to get to all the amenities um, very easily. Uh, the site layout for the pocket neighborhood uh, would be the one on the right-hand side as you're looking at your screen. And uh, as you can see, the homes are all connected through a common garden, uh, garden space and common amenities. And uh, all of the front porches face on the inside and on the back uh, would be the garages. Um, this is an overview, um, some renderings of what uh, it will look like. Um, we plan to break ground in um, March of 2019. We have to install the infrastructure yet, um, so that'll happen um, hopefully this winter is the plan for that. Um, and so this is the rendering of the, the homes. Um, we have four different designs so that they all don't look alike, uh, but all the interiors will be alike because all the floor plans are the same. And there's a, a couple of the designs as well as the layout inside. Uh, we're fortunate that we'll be able to have basements in these homes. They'll be unfinished, but um, the owners uh, can finish them if they so desire, if they have the funding down the road. And um, the option for two bedroom is there should uh, they want to take one of the bedrooms out to make it larger. Um, our funding sources for this project are, are varied. And again, it's about people, planning, and partnerships. Um, tax increment financing from the city of Makokata, they are um, providing that, which is $435,000 for the infrastructure, which would be the water, sewer, and the road that you saw on the site there. Um, the land donated uh, was from the Jackson County Supervisors. Uh, they've had that land uh, returned to them through the tax rolls, and so they uh, are providing the site for us. And that site is about two and a half acres, and we can easily get the 10 homes on that. Um, our Eastern Iowa Regional Housing Corporation uh, Trust Fund is providing $25,000 a unit for construction, and they're doing that over two years. So we'll build five homes in the first year and five homes in the second year. 
And then um, they're also providing the $10,000 down payment over two years, so $10,000 for the uh, $50,000 for the first year and $50,000 in the second year. We have a Realtors Association grant that was for $2,000 to help pay for some of the renderings. Uh, we also have um, an Iowa Area Development Group uh, Foundation grant for $10,000 that help pay for some of our legal fees, as well as our, um, our, our blueprint and our design of the homes. Uh, we partnered with the University of Iowa uh, Sustainable Communities Program. Uh, they're engineering students. Uh, we're in their final year of engineering studies, and we did that this past January to May, and they were able to do some of the utility extension designs and uh, the foundation layouts for us, so that helped save some money. And then we've applied to the Federal Home Loan Bank for an affordable housing uh, program grant for $20,000 per unit, and that is pending right now, and we should know about that in November. Um, the benefits to the community of this project, uh, it addresses our shortage for affordable workforce housing. Uh, at least helps to start that. We plan to make this a model that could be replicated in our other communities around the region. Um, it's affordable new construction for buyers um, that's not being done by the private sector. There really is no profit margin for us. We do have $7,000 a house built in um, for staff time as we're working with households and qualifying them and working through getting them, helping them get mortgages. So uh, we do have that built in. Um, it does increase um, the valuation and tax revenues because right now that property is vacant. There's nothing on it. Uh, there's no tax revenue at all. So after the ta tax increment financing is paid off, there will be revenues for um, the city, county, and school district. The economic benefits, um, the overall construction will generate about $2.23 million in economic output, um, as well as constructing the homes. Um, we have anticipate 12.6 workers would be hired through that, and the labor income would be over $370,000. Um, additional school revenue if new children move into the district. We see this location as ideal um, for commuting. It's 25 minutes um, from Dubuque, and it's about 25 minutes from Davenport, which is south, uh, which is a larger metro area. So easily commutable, all on four-lane transportation. Um, we also look at it uh, as appealing, as I said earlier, to a wide variety of buyers. And it supports local business and employee recruitment. And um, actually, in some communities where we're looking at doing this, it does clean up a slum and blight area. In this area, it's not like that at all. It, it's a great area of the community, but uh, we are looking at a couple of other communities that would clean up um, an area. Now I'm going to talk about a second project that's happening in Iowa. Um, it's through the Iowa Council of Governments uh, that ECI is a member of. Um, I am not the lead on this project. Uh, Southern Iowa Council of Governments, they are the lead. Um, it's the Southern Iowa Regional Planning Commission and um, the Iowa Council of Governments, our association. Uh, but it is a very exciting project and it's a unique project. Um, so the overall um, project is uh, modeled after South Dakota, the Governor's House Program. Uh, basically, stiff building two and three, build, uh, three bedroom homes that will be trucked to infill uh, lots within communities. Um, we are going to develop our own uh, nonprofit uh, to manage this. Um, and actually, we are going to build the homes adjacent to the Newton Correctional Facility, which is in the middle of our state uh, near Des Moines. Uh, we're about uh, three hours from Des Moines. Um, to the east, and so, uh, and then to the west of Des Moines, you go another about two and a half hours. So right in the center of our state is where the Newton Correctional Facility is. Um, and basically, it'll be a pipeline of apprentice trades to the construction industry. So we will be partnering with Iowa Prison Industries to actually build these homes. Um, and so it'll be a training program for those prisoners that are close to exiting uh, the system. And uh, we will be selling the homes at a lower cost, uh, under $100,000 for income qualified buyers. And what they've noticed that, and you know, prisoners that participate in these type of programs, there's a lower rate of them returning into the system and um, fewer crimes in the future. So we look at it as a win-win across the board. Um, the Iowa Council of Governments, so the partnership again, uh, partnership is, is key to this. Um, it's the Iowa Council of Governments, and there's 17 of us in Iowa, the Iowa Prison Industries, the community colleges, and the state legislature. Uh, we need all of them on board to, to make this happen. 
Um, this shows the site here of, of what we're proposing um, to be able to build the facility, to build the homes. So there will have to be a staging area to build them, as well as a staging area to uh, keep all of the various supplies that we're going to need. And this will all be um, obviously secure uh, and part of that Newton Correctional Facility. Um, this is a photo of some of the homes that they're doing um, in South Dakota. Um, so they are not, I would say, not as cute, um, uh, not as unique as our pocket neighborhood homes, um, but they also are much less expensive. And so basically, uh, we would have to, we meaning the Council of Governments, would need to have sites ready for these homes to be trucked to. Um, so that would mean that they would have to have um, the land um, and the water and the sewer ready and the foundation um, so that these homes could be put on them. Um, I kind of look at it as if you're doing like an all-American home or a prefab type home, uh, but these will actually be stick built and then trucked to uh, the site. And this is the organizational structure. Uh, these are all the different Council of Governments that are in Iowa. We have one of them that also um, goes into Illinois slightly and a couple of them that go into Nebraska as well. Um, so the sales network would really be us, the Council of Governments. And then um, the homeowners, nonprofits, contractors, um, the purchases will all go through the, the Council of Governments. And we'll coordinate the assistance that would be available to the purchasers. Obviously, the buyers would be individuals that are in these communities. They would have to be able to get a first mortgage. Um, and so they would have to work with their, their lending institutions. But um, like our agency also does housing counseling, so we'll be able to provide some of that guidance to people uh, interested in the homes. Um, we will ensure that the building sites are developable, developable and the homes are targeted to that income qualified buyer. Um, so this won't compete with existing home builders because that is a question, well, how does this compete with existing builders? Well, at this point, there are no builders building homes in Iowa at this price point. Um, so again, we're not competing with the private sector. We're trying to fill a void that the private sector is un unable to do. Um, the apprenticeship opportunities are there. So part of this is that those that are getting ready to exit the system um, you know, a year or two out from it, uh, are able to get employable skills so that when they do um, exit, they're able to have a career in uh, like a floor layer, a painter, electrician, plumbing, HVAC, carpenter, drywall, finisher, building inspector. So uh, different trades that they're able to learn um, while they're in the system. And again, another way of trying to address uh, the workforce shortage, because not only do we have a housing shortage, but we also, as many of you do, have a workforce shortage as well. Um, so our next steps on this, um, we are asking um, our legislature for a one-time state appropriation for the capital startup cost to be able to ready that Newton facility for this. Um, so basically, what we need is a million dollars for that to happen. Um, we also uh, need to incorporate our nonprofit um, entity. Uh, we need to look at how we're going to market and solidify the sales and the organizational structure of that. Um, we need to work on the apprenticeship program with the community colleges. So that's where they come in to develop the apprenticeship program. And then um, we are in the process of doing the final um, decisions on the home designs and, and the offerings that the homes will have and then um, our forecast models for income and, and revenue. Um, something else that I want to briefly touch on that's important too is, you know, you can have housing and have these uh, homes in a community, but you also need to um, have some creative placemaking. So it's about, you know, a people-centered approach to building a strong, vibrant community through cultural and entrepreneurial amenities, concept, and catalytic projects. So I just wanted to talk about that briefly because um, you're not going to draw people to a rural community unless they have something to do once they're there or something to do within the region once they're there, something that's easily um, gotten to, commute, uh, commuted to, um, amenities that um, they can enjoy along with the affordable housing. And so um, I'm calling it housing plus amenities. And so things uh, that we have been working with our communities on and you know, the smaller communities of, you know, under uh, 5,000 uh, really have been focusing on uh, community art and community theater. Uh, there's a lot of local breweries that are popping up. 
um, enchanting downtowns. Uh, we've got several communities uh, working on Main Street designations or have been Main Street designated and are working to um, improve their downtowns. Uh, local restaurants and local shopping, uh, very important. Um, aquatic facilities, you know, small um, splash pads have been a big deal in our, our rural areas. Um, recreational trails, we've got um, a partnership that was formed um, that is a three county region working on um, regional parks and regional trails and marketing those together so that it's a tourist destination as well as a life destination uh, to come to those areas. Um, as well as maker spaces. Um, are there spaces for entrepreneurs to uh, be able to um, develop and home grow their business? Are there uh, spaces for farmers markets? Are there spaces for um, uh, people to do um, evening and, and activities that, that they can get together and collaborate around? So there's a lot of other discussions going on outside of just, oh, we need a house and a community. Um, the discussions go beyond there as to what else can we provide uh, in addition to that to maintain um, our current population and to draw new into our, into our region. And so uh, my motto is always coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, and working together is success. And that's what we try to, try to live by. And so I believe um, later on we'll uh, be open for questions. So I will turn it back to David and uh, thank all of you for being here today. Kelly, thanks so much. I really appreciate that presentation. I hope folks enjoyed it as much as I did. We're gonna come back to a broader uh, session of questions after our second speaker. Let me run through, Kelly, a couple of really fast, maybe one or two word answers that we can knock off before we get to the bigger uh, or the broader thematic questions. Uh, and these have come in from, we got a whole host of questions that came in from folks. So. Let me know, uh, hopefully these are easy ones to answer. Well, I think you said the size of the parcels were two. Two and uh, a half, what, yeah, for yeah. 10 homes, um, for 10 homes, two and a half acres, and on that two and a half acres, we will also have the community garden space, um, a small gazebo area, uh, and 10 uh, raised bed gardens um, that wow. people can do community gardening. Uh, I noticed last week was National Leave Zucchini on Your Neighbor's Porch Week. <laughs> I really appreciated that. I'm sure your folks did as well. Uh, what's the typical property tax for these homes? Um, the property tax are around uh, 1500 to 2000 a year. And if you could quickly list again your funding sources for the trust fund? Um, we have the Housing Trust Fund. It's the Eastern Iowa Regional Corporation Housing Trust Fund. Uh, and that's funding us um, for $25,000 a unit, plus an additional $10,000 a unit for down payment assistance. Um, we've applied to the Federal Home Loan Bank for $20,000 a unit. Um, we've also received $10,000 from the McDonough Foundation. Uh, we received $10,000 from the Iowa Area Development Group. Uh, we've received $2,000 from the Realtors Association, and we received the land for free from the Jackson County Supervisors, and we received, and the, the city, oh my, cannot forget our most important partner has been the city of Maquoketa uh, for $435,000 for um, the uh, infrastructure. I do also want to know here, too, that we are the Council of Government, so we have our economic development entity, but we are working very closely with Jackson County Economic Alliance, who is actually in Maquoketa. They're housed there, but they cover Jackson County. Um, their two staff have been fa fabulous through this process. They have been like the liaison between um, the county, the city, ourselves, the school district, um, local builders, the realtors. So. It takes um, a, a team to, to, That's to great. do this. And, and I think we'll return to some of the, the planning people and partnerships theme that you raised, because I know a lot about Suzanne's successful work. I have a whole lot of other questions. Some are small like that, some are bigger. I'm gonna have to uh, say that we'll return to those uh, so as we make sure and save enough time uh, for our next speaker here. So don't go away, Kelly, we'll be back. All right, thank you. For our next speaker, I'd like to introduce Suzanne Anardi, Vice President of the Local Initiative Support Corporation. I think we, many of us know them as LISC. She's the Director of Rural LISC. Suzanne has been serving rural communities her entire career. 
She was the founding executive director of Tri-County Housing in Colorado. She joined Rural Lisk in 2005. And in 2010, she uh, was promoted to uh, Lisk's senior program director. She was managing loan and grant portfolios for partners across California, Oregon, and Utah. In 2013, Suzanne was appointed Rural Lisk's vice president, overseeing revitalization work with 86 rural community-based organizations across 44 states. Phew. Suzanne served on the Colorado State Housing Board for seven years and was president of the Fowler School Board for 18 years as an elective representative of this rural school district in southeastern Colorado. Um, she also serves as a board member with Fannie Mae's Affordable Housing Advisory Council, National Rural Housing Co Coalition, the U.S. Bank Advisory Committee, Dakota's America Advisory Board, CEI's National Advisory Board in rural Maine, and a whole list of other places. I am thrilled often when I hear that Suzanne has called to talk to me. She's one of the best sources of information in our rural housing community, and I'm excited to turn it over to her. Thank you, David. Um, I appreciate that warm introduction. And Kelly, wow, that was I loved your presentation. Um, I, I I like to see the granular stuff that's happening on the ground, and uh, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in Iowa. I learned a lot, as I'm sure the other uh, did as well. Um, so we're all we're gonna we're gonna kind of take a, a, a global view of some things that are happening across the nation. As David said, uh, I I run the National Rural uh, Program of LISC. We have 34 urban uh, peers as well. And um, we work with and through local partners. Uh, we have 86 of those, soon to be 87. And we work with and through those partners to achieve their goals and their communities um, and their footprint, which encompasses 44 states and over 2,000 rural counties. We are launching a new economic development strategy which we call Catalyzing Opportunities in America's Rural Communities. And we're really excited about it. Uh, but this, this webinar is really timely because we, we, we're not stepping away from housing. We're not stepping away from safety, health, education, individual and family self-sufficiency, any of that. It all has to happen together for rural communities to not only survive, but to thrive. So I, I wanted to share uh, today some of our best practices and um, some of the things that we're seeing across the nation that are really exciting and um, really uh, have some economic impact as well as uh, serve different uh, aspects of community and that continuum of housing. So, uh, and if I can figure out how to my arrows aren't there. Sorry, technical difficulties here. Oh, there they are. Ooh, okay. So the first, the first project I want to talk to you about is um, mutual housing at Springland at, at Spring Lake in Woodland, California. It provides permanent year-round housing for agricultural workers, workers and their families. Um, you know, ag workers have traditionally suffered some of the worst housing conditions and the most dangerous jobs in the country. A survey of ag workers in the region uh, of Woodland in 2010 showed that people reported living in garages with mold, cockroaches, and often in overcrowded conditions. Many workers were only employed seasonally. However, most ag workers, even though they were only um, employed seasonally, stayed in the community all year long. Uh, our partner, Mutual Housing California, based in Sacramento, um, embarked on this project to meet those needs and those um, underserved community members. The it's the first permanent year-round housing built for ag workers' families in the county, and most of those are Hispanic. I was honored with one of two 2017 World Habitat Awards. There were over 100 entries. Um, and it was the first certified zero net energy ready multi housing community in the country. The project and the, the compound 
composed of 62 apartment houses that about 230 farm workers and their children live in. Um, they're equipped with solar panels to offset nearly all of the residents' utility bills. Um, their landscaping choices, which include native plants, um, pervious ground cover, deep watered fruit trees and community gardens cut their irrigation needs in half. There's a theme here. This, this is a very economical project. Their community laundry facilities and water saving plumbing fixtures cut their indoor water use by 40% or more. Um, the other component that is, is really positive and supportive in this, in this community is that there is a strong focus on community development and the empowerment of individuals. Um, community organizing is a core activity, giving folks a voice, and the project has really been built about building a, an entire community, not just con constructing houses. Um, much of, as Kelly said, where folks go in and they don't know what their neighbors are doing. Um, that's the rural way, that's our culture, is to really integrate and be good neighbors, and this community um, really supports and facilitates that. The residents are actively involved in education and training programs, including um, financial education and budget management, green issues, leadership development, and health education. One of the things in our catalyzing economic development um, document, our, our strategy, really it is built around um, financial management and budget financial education and financial literacy and budget management. So it's super important that that folks have a home, but also that they have access to all of these resources, which only help them be better employees, entrepreneurs, and, and contribute to the economic impact in the community. The next one I want to talk to you about is in Kingston, New York, the Lace Factory. I've actually been to this um, amazing site. Uh, it's a former industrial site. It now has 50, 55 units of artist housing and gallery spaces. Um, one of the other things I tag on to what Kelly was talking about in creative placemaking, uh, three or four years ago, I guess four years ago, we launched a creative placemaking cohesive economic development strategy. It was really interesting um, how, our, how some of our housing folks, our housing partners, didn't didn't connect the dots, but they applied, hoping for some technical assistance. And over the years, we now have doubled the number of grants that we give and um, our partners that participate. So this, um, this project really um, illustrates uh, creative placemaking place, place and how that can um, really catalyze a neighborhood and a community. It, it's supported, uh, we supported this um, project with equity, uh, over $10 million in equity, um, which included federal low-income housing tax credits, historic tax credits, and New York State historic tax credits as well. We also provided um, in excess of $45,000 in grants for pre-development um, capacity building for the organization in arts and culture or creative place making. Um, this was conceived initially as both a housing complex and an economic development effort. It's an 18 million project, million dollar project. Uh, it's really coming into its own as a center of cultural activity, as well as providing affordable housing for the growing arts community in this region. There are 55 affordable rental units and all are occupied by artists. It also has several gallery spaces, work studios and sculpture gardens. It's a great integration of bringing the community in uh, they have all, all sorts of different events, um, you know, whether it's Rotary, whether it's a reception, um, you know, hosted by one of the local businesses. Uh, they not only create a community within the building, but they, they bring the community in to the building as well. We're hopping across the country. Um, Oops. Okay. Um, sorry, I am my I'm really having trouble advancing in slides. So I'll take you now to Orcas Island, Washington. And um, our partner there is Opal Community Land Trust. And um, Orcas Islands in the San Juan Islands of Northwest Washington attracts people from far and wide. 
visitors, part-time residents, full-time transplants. It's really an idyllic place. However, it has a limited supply of land, has a seasonal service economy, and some of the lowest wages in the state. Um, all of these conspire to create property values that are out of reach for working islanders. As a result, many local wage earners find it impossible to own a home or even find a suitable rental. OPAL, which stands of stands for Of People and Land, was formed in 1989 by a small group of island residents who recognized the impact of this affordability gap and what it, how it would impact the well-being of the Orcas community. Uh, the island's mix of people with a wide range of incomes and the diversity would be lost, not to mention the essential services that are provided um, by many of those individuals. Some, some things to note, because this is a really unique um, area of the country. San Juan County is the only county in Washington state where a middle income household cannot afford to buy a median price home. Typical first time home buyers have only 37% of the income needed to purchase a median price home in San Juan County. 37% um, for a first time home buyer, that's um, pretty astounding. Renters with very low incomes, earning about $12 per hour, have only 26% of the income needed for market rate rentals. They need four times what they make in, in order to um, uh, access a market rate rental. Our partner, Opal, created a solution that created a supply of affordable housing for island residents, including and especially the local workforce, so that it could remain a community asset for gen generations to come. Opal acquires the land and buildings, develops the land in an environmentally and socially responsible manner, constructs or renovates buildings that are healthy, durable, and energy efficient, educates and counsels home buyers and rental ten tenants, and then they steward what it is, is created for current and future generations. Now we'll go to Florida. Um, Pollywog Creek Commons, I've also been lucky enough to, to visit this uh, this project. Um, rural Neighborhoods is um, our partner in this region. Um, Pollywog Creek Commons is an affordable rental community, 64 garden apartments uh, in LaBelle, Florida. It's a small town of a, a little over 4,600, um, and it's in Hendry County. It's located on a river. It's the headquarters to the U.S. Sugar Corporation, and the local economy is strongly tied to agriculture. Six of seven top area employers grow sugarcane and citrus. Uh, Latino residents make up one half of county residents and one quarter of county residents live below the national poverty level. Um, as, as probably most of you know, 86% of, um, of the persistent poverty communities are in rural, um, and that in itself creates uh, challenges. Pollywog Creek Commons um, is really a well-designed, affordable community for local ag employees and their families. It also includes senior housing. Um, one part of it is, is ag, one part of it is senior. And then if you look um, where they have the vacant land, you can see on the slide, they are uh, now they just got tax credits for a family project uh, that is just a straight lie tech. Um, so the intergenerational community is also part of their approach. It's just off Main Street. It's close to all of the amenities. Families can walk to nearby grocery restaurants. There's an urgent care at an adjacent clinic. It just is an easy and attractive uh, contribution to the local economy. Um, Bozeman, Montana. I'll take you to the middle of the country now. Um, Bozeman, as many of you may know, is really a tourism mecca and uh, a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, we had a seminar for all of our partners and brought everyone together there last year, and we're all fortunate enough to get to see the um, Housing First Village uh, development. Um, the, the real goal behind uh, this was the fact that it's also very cold in Bozeman and there's a homeless population. So uh, HRDC, Human Resource Development Council of District 9, which is our partner, is based in Bozeman. 
and they partnered with Montana State University architectural students and they're developing uh, 30 to 50 low barrier tiny private homes um, it's called Housing First Village. The homes provide autonomy, safety, and transformational housing for vulnerable populations in Gallatin Park and Meagher counties. Um, they are incorporating, by doing this, they incorporate those vulnerable populations into the community, and that provides a basis for their reentry into the workforce. Um, you know, it's no secret that to get a job, you need an address. Um, you need a place to sleep. The things, all of the things that vulnerable populations um, need in order to re-enter, um, HRDC has put together um, as well as social services associated with that. Um, additionally, uh, it gives the community a facelift, making it more attractive to tourism and the uh, economic benefits that come from this being in the community having this asset. Um, I, you know, when we talk about, when we think about seniors um, as, and, and Kelly hit it right on the head, you know, they're occupying in small rural communities so often uh, a, a, an important part of the housing continuum in a community. They're in big homes that have been, in, you know, that they've raised their children in. And, um, if they don't have somewhere to transition where they can age in place, um, you know, often they leap from uh, staying in that home longer than they should, then they leap right away into an assisted or um, a nursing home situation. And so in, in Maryland, uh, the Meadows provides 90 units of affordable elderly housing units in rural Western Maryland. Fund. Our partner, Garrett County Community Action Committee, um, is the developer, owner, developer, and manager of this property. Um, it is, uh, it, it was a unique project in that um, they're both by 15s. One was new construction, one was uh, a rehab. It represents a rural housing model for Maryland's smart, green, and growing policy with goals of strengthening the economy, protecting the environment, and improving the quality of life. Um, the three tenets of that are preserving existing affordable housing in a priority area, using a design that accommodates walking access to services, and creating a small village to enhance personal interaction and responsibility. The site layout and plans also has, uh, has future plans for a senior center, which would be financed and developed separately, providing a means for older and disabled persons to age in place, extend their independence, and provide a higher quality of life. Uh, taking you to Indiana, um, our partner there, Pathfinder Services, um, they, they really, uh, are a diverse organization with a very clear focus on their mission. They emphasize four key program areas um, and that foster individual and community development. Um, they tie affordable housing with education and training, employment services, and community integration. They build family and individual self-sufficiency by strengthening farm worker, rural and urban communities combining planning, vision, multi-sector stakeholder input, and marshalling strategically targeted public and private resources to redevelop low-income communities. This is a really interesting organization, and um, I, I know that these, this uh, PowerPoint's gonna be available to everyone, but going to some of these websites of our partners is really um, interesting and beneficial, uh, Pathfinder, and Pathfinder Services in particular really um, does a great job with uh, disabled individuals. Uh, traveling to rural Kentucky, um, manufactured housing has always been a part of the continuum uh, of housing in rural communities. Um, our partner, which ironically um, didn't do housing until a few years ago. There is Kentucky Highlands. They are definitely an economic engine in rural Kentucky um, and Appalachia. And they came to us with an idea um, on how to recycle old, outdated, outdated trailer sites where the um, the 
units were not attached to the land. And uh, so there was no equity being built. Um, and in many cases, those tenants were at the mercy of uh, landlords. So they, we, we, we gave, we've invested over 71,000 in the pre-development of this project. Um, what they're seeking to do is reduce the prevalence of the pre-78, the old manufactured, older manufactured homes in favor of new homes that conform to state building codes and offer better energy performance and greater dur durability. Um, their goal is to help marginally house uh, people achieve greater housing stability, exert more control over their housing choice, and ultimately own homes that provide better energy performance and healthier physical environment. Um, where this site is located, um, the, the change is going to positively change the economic and cultural forces um, in, and also provide permanent housing that's attractive and, and positively contributes to the economic impact in a community. Um, these homes will be built to state code and they have, a, they have put together a variety of financing options available to the, homer, to the owners or to the potential homeowners that will help them accrue equity at a greater rate. This, this next, um, the lease to own program in CVHC, Coachella Valley Housing Coalition in Indio, California. Um, this is kind of a turning positive into negatives, making lemons into lemonade. This idea was hatched um, in the crisis in 2008 when there were so many homes on the market and uh, Coachella is traditionally a mutual self-help housing organization and um, the market crashed, appraisals crashed, the mutual self-help housing uh, program was not provide, or that model was not providing the equity return that they wanted to see for their families. And so um, what they did was they turned this around and we provided them with loan money and started buying quality homes and working through their um, pipeline of potential homeowners, um, helping them get into homes um, through this lease to own program. Uh, the beauty of it was that it was run by Coachella Valley Housing Coalition with a mission, uh, with with a strong homeownership mission. Um, the the the, tradi the traditional buyer or the occupant, least to own um, participant, was uh, a family or an individual who wasn't yet ready to buy a house due to credit or lack of funds, and so they they established them first as renters. And then they, they committed to working with a housing credit counselor month, monthly to stabilize their income, improve their credit, and learn about the home buying process in order to be ready to buy the home they are living in when their credit income improves. So you have st stability provided, children don't change schools when they transition into home ownership, um, they've created relationships with their neighbors. It was it was really, really a creative way to um, take a bad situation and help um, folks who uh, transition to home ownership. In Elkins, West Virginia, um, this is again is a I'm lucky I've gotten to be I've gotten to see so many of these firsthand. Um, Highland Community Builders is our partner there. And um, the historic First Ward School was converted to a low-income senior community apartment complex. Um, it is it was designed with accessibility and safety in mind, um, wide doorways and halls, grab bars, walk-in showers, elevator, controlled access entry, which I think is really important in elderly housing. Um, they also have several senior programs that they coordinate services for residents. Um, hourly bus stops, a healthy home program for tenants interested in setting and achieving health and wellness goals. And again, um, providing an opportunity for elderly uh, individuals to stay in their communities, um, support their families, be close to their families, but live in a, in a safe and efficient manner. Um, so I, I would close with, um, I have limited details on, on 
on all of these various uh, sites and exciting uh, initiatives that I've shared with you, but we can certainly connect the dots. That's what we like to think that we do is connect, connect our folks um, to resources, whether it's technical assistance, whether it's um, financial resources, but most importantly to each other. And we like to be to do that with, with the folks that are on this call. If there's something of particular interest, um, I don't have all of this in my mind, but uh, definitely we can connect you to folks who do. I'd encourage you to check the websites of our partners that we've highlighted. And then lastly, something that I can offer is um, we put out a rural e-news. If you're not on our 2200 plus uh, distribution list, please let us know. We'll be happy to put you on. You can go to our website and um, get on that. Uh, that distribution list, but it's a monthly online newsletter specifically for rural community and economic developers. Um, it's got funding, training opportunities, um, new information, um, and uh, the primary purpose is really to connect the dots, reduce the isolation of those of us that work in rural communities, um, providing up-to-date information on relevant topics for education and growth, and um, really just connecting us as a, as a unit. All right. Well, Suzanne, thank you very much for your presentation. That was a fantastic set of examples and a great overlay. I'd like to uh, recognize that there are a significant number of questions coming in. And uh, if we can't get to those in the remaining 19 minutes here, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to through uh, IEDC. Uh, but I'd like to turn the question back to a theme that, um, that ties together many of the questions we've gotten, and that was about the creative placemaking. So who, to Kelly, maybe you can start with us. Who's, who's providing some of the resources to support the creative placemaking elements uh, in the project you highlighted? Well, in uh, a lot of our rural communities, it's the Chamber of Commerces. Um, it is the economic development, like the county economic development organizations. Uh, it's also, uh, we've got a couple of programs um, that are statewide. Uh, one of them is called Keep Iowa Beautiful, the Hometown Pride Program, where uh, a county or a community can apply for a community coach, and they help um, drive those efforts forward. Uh, and again, that's a, a state program, but it's um, really been awesome for a couple of our uh, communities. So it's a, it's a combination um, of, of efforts. And Suzanne, turning a similar question to you, uh, as the as the sites are selected and identified, many of the projects you worked on, um, and yet maybe they are not on-site housing amenities near the obviously the the choice of the land with getting near an enchanting downtown or something along those lines is important. Who nationally have you seen and talked to that can also provide the kind of creative placemaking support that make these programs or uh, housing projects successful? So I, I think that it's important to to think about it um, from a from a standpoint of uh, you know it can be so so in Florida rural neighborhood you know has art in art statues and different kinds of of creative placing actually right within their um, housing uh, their housing sites and um, you know versus in Hazard Kentucky you know they had a they had a corner or it was actually a triangle that really was a, a hot crime spot and so they came to us, we provided them with some grant funds. They got some from their local chamber, as Kelly said. This, our CDC partner put in some money. Um, you know, I think Walmart may have put in some money. And what they did was they created, they cleaned it up first. And of course, the city and the county, if we get our friendly local governments and rural, they're our eye in the sky. Um, they also came to the table. And so they created a, a First Friday uh, opportunity that is a, um, a festival. So vendors come and sell their wares. It's become a family night versus, um, and so I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it fits into so many elements of the community. Um, you know, there's a lot of information. Rupri, uh, Chuck and his, his group, uh, have a lot of technical assistance opportunities for uh, creative placemaking. How we 
it kind of it highlighted to the top for us was we have a staff member, Bob Reeder, who is really um, well known for rural creative placemaking. At Nationalist, we have uh, our creative placemaking team as well as part of our economic development strategy. So I think, um, you know, doing some research, going to Rupri's website, I think there's a lot of places that you can find connections um, to help uh, craft a strategy. And when I hear your examples and Kelly's examples, um, I recognize as is the case with the work that the Housing Assistance Council does as well. Uh, we are often a supporter or an intermediary uh, looking to the local organizations to come up with and drive the solution. And we're looking to find uh, partnerships for them. Can you, especially Kelly, maybe jumping in here, is give us a concrete example of how uh, with a project, you were able to get one of those important partnerships uh, solidified in what it produced. Well, um, wow, let's see. In the case, I guess this is a, a, a different project that I didn't highlight here, but um, we had a community that had a um, blighted, old, uh, dilapidated mobile home park. And so the community had been citing the owner. And so, uh, but the owner was ignoring um, the citations. And so we acted as kind of that go-between the council of government did as the catalyst to help make something happen. So that was one of our first nonprofits that we spun off. So we met with the property owner and uh, we offered him um, the opportunity to sell us the mobile home park. And um, it gave him a fairly good price for it. Uh, and then we asked him to remove all of the dilapidated mobile homes because I think there was only one um, person living there at the time. And for us then, we were that catalyst, so we were able to purchase that property. And then um, the following year, we applied for low-income housing tax credits, and so we were awarded those credits, and then we built a 32-unit, um, two-, three-, and four-bedroom townhouse-style uh, rentals. And then we also had enough property to do six, uh, homes that we could actually sell. They were three bedroom homes that we sold to 80% of the county median and below. So um, it was a combination of the city and ourselves uh, and then the low income housing tax credit program and it really uh, changed the, the entire neighborhood. Um, and so it was kind of a, a partnership between the, the current, the owner that was, uh, the city and ourselves. That's great. And you started to touch on some of the capital stack there, Kelly, that you need in going for tax credits and other things. Suzanne, if you want to maybe list out some of the more common ways in which you can raise capital for projects like this. Uh, we have several questions here in the in the section for asking the, about how you stack the capital. For, for the housing? Yeah. For, for the housing. Okay. Okay. So um, I think Kelly and I probably have learned from the same playbook. Um, you know, always your HFA, Federal Home Loan Bank. Um, I think uh, you know, depending on the type of uh, the type of housing, you know, then you you can look for a different a different avenue. Um, employers, uh, obviously, that's not often um, a cash, but um, you know, there there are other ways for them to come to the table. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to go way back to the to my Tri County days. You know, um, power company uh, came to the table and donated land. The county was continually providing dirt, um, fill dirt. Um, I think that uh, you know your USDA folks should be your best friends, um, and and they I think uh, are often at the table. Uh, the local governments, as we talked about, your local banker, um, you know, the federal home loan bank funds that you can go through, get through them as well. Um, you know, I, I think we're seeing a lot of different, um, sometimes some corporate interest. Uh, the tax credits, you just cannot say enough about. Our folks, um, you know, are in the LIHTC uh, realm. Um, the historic tax credits, as I talked about in some of the um, different uh, developments that that we showcased um, bond financing um, you know I see those in the capital stack often um, and you know uh, that's there, there's a there's a whole I think I think you can't there's all these federal 
and then you go to the state side, right? Um, but I think um, there's a lot of creativeness going on locally as well. And so, um, you know, it, Kelly hit it on the head when she said it's a partnership. Um, you know, I, I've, I've used our local gardening club to do uh, landscaping, uh, different, you know, the Rotary Club, the Lions Club. Everybody, um, if, if, they're, if, they're, if the common goal is there, um, it's little pieces that all into one mosaic that hopefully you can count as success. The success of some of the projects here, I think a number of the questions are pulling it here, is how they're integrated into the planning process itself. And so there are, there are of course, larger uh, uh, regional plans, but I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Kelly, when you talked about having planning people and partnerships, what literally are you talking about is the planning process and who are your partners in it? Well, we have, um, ECA is the Economic Development District uh, for our five counties, and so we have um, the um, SEDS document or the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy that we do every five years and then we update annually. So our uh, economic developers as well as the community colleges and our workforce partners um, are part of our planning committee for that document. And so in there we have identified that workforce housing is really almost in crisis mode for our region. And so the planning piece comes from there. So these people meet every month and we you know, pick a priority, we talk about it, we look at how we can work towards it. And so uh, that piece came out of there. Now then also locally, a lot of them, uh, a lot of our communities have you know, obviously comp plans, land use plans, um, and then our housing needs assessments that have been done recently throughout the region as well. So those all feed in together um, to, to make it work, to make a project happen. And Suzanne, how do you encourage and support your grantees uh, using existing planning processes? Um, I think, you know, we don't have to encourage a lot because many of them are um, either uh, a driver or they're definitely at the table um, and you know they have their partnerships locally um, we obviously when we're looking at an investment of any kind um, that's something we look at is how it fits into the overall um, whether it's a housing plan or community plan um, whatever whatever's in existence um, and uh, we look at that but uh, I, I think for the most part our folks bring to the table um, initiatives or developments that have, have been vetted through that process, um, much as Kelly was mentioning, uh, regionally most of the time, um, but you know, often it drills down into a, a county or a, even a, a small town having a plan. And a couple of, uh, uh, per I would, I would imagine our audience talking to some housers like us uh, in presenting that a lot of questions here on workforce uh, and and starting with Kelly, the, the way in which you attracted uh, businesses and developers to actually be using the apprenticeship program uh, that you noted. Well, the apprenticeship program that I was talking about is actually going through the Iowa prison industries um, and the community colleges. So um, we're not necessarily, we're using that, but it's a, it's a way to develop the homes. So it wouldn't be the private develop, developers using it. It's really um, us utilizing it, the Council of Governments, to have homes built to shipped out. So um, as far as other workforce-related apprenticeship programs, um, you know, we work closely with our community colleges to be able to promote those as well as with our economic developers when they're out talking about the needs of workers um, and then work through the community college and through our uh, Iowa workforce development for those opportunities. But, but the one I discussed is really us going through the community college to do it. And for either of you, is there a uh, workforce issue in the building and trades construction uh, in the regions you're working in and if so uh, what kinds of things are you doing to try to address that? I would say um, just having come back from rural Texas yesterday um, where we're working down there 
post-disaster. Uh, there, there's certainly a lack there. Um, I think we see it across the nation as well, but it's really highlighted um, there in that um, they're, especially if they're close to a big urban site, they can go work in the urban, uh, in the urban context, uh, make bigger money. Um, and so even if there is the skill in the community, um, or in the rural county, um, what we're seeing is is that you know folks are going to go where um, there's a, a livable wage. And so um, I think there, I think the answer is is kind of both ways. Some places there's not that skill, um, and that's something that we, we work on. For example, down in rural rural Mississippi, through some of our workforce development um, work there, there's a lot in in that in that trade space that we're doing. Um, but conversely, um, if there is, uh, if they're close to an urban center, um, that's often where they go to work. Granted, their money comes back to that community at night, but the, the skills, skills are not really utilized within that rural region. So for many of the stick-built uh, structures in, in rural places, the developers are also looking at uh, manufactured and factory built, uh, either elements or full construction. Uh, Kelly, I know you certainly started to talk about that with the um, the structures you were talking about in the pocket uh, neighborhood. Are those two things related, the workforce issues and the manufacturing? What's driving a rise in the use of manufactured housing? Um, well, in our case, for uh, the pocket neighborhood, we are going to do um, stick-built homes. We have priced uh, the modular home, uh, and it's more expensive. Um, and so because we are, are targeting 80% of the county median, we can't afford to do that. So we are working with a local builder to build those homes. Um, and we have bid it out um, three different times to make sure we're getting the best uh, per square foot cost. But you know, what we've noticed is uh, that a jump in just lumber costs and a jump in housing costs overall, in our region, it's been about 6% since 2017 to 2018. So we're having to build those additional costs into our, our home prices. Um, as far as the project that the Iowa Council of Governments is doing, those would be stick built as well. And that's trying to address the needs uh, somewhat of the contractors in our region because we do have a shortage of, of uh, construction labor and so those that are currently incarcerated would be trained in all those different skills related to construction by building these homes so that when they get out they have a career so we're trying to do it's, it's kind of a, a kill two birds with one stone kind of thing get people trained uh, for construction trade as well as build affordable homes on site and then have them shipped and another way of addressing some of that, of course, is different materials. We have a particular question here um, about any of the projects we're aware of having utilized CLT or other forms of mass timber. Uh, have you seen that sort of modern materials as a way to address cost issues? I have not. I'm not sure if Suzanne has, but I, I have not. I hear, I've heard discussion about it. I don't think we've ever, we've actually seen um, a development come our way for investment that was specific to that. Um, I, David, I wanted to, on the manufactured, I just wanted to mm -hmm. chime in. Again, with the disaster lens, one of the communities we're working in has 90 homes, 90 homes that have been slated for demolition, relocation. And so one of the considerations for that small community, you know, that that's 90 taps for the water and sewer, 90 kids in their schools, or, you know, give or take. Um, and so one of the things that they're looking at in terms of replacement housing and relocation housing is manufactured. And the reason being is we're struggling with, to get contractors um, to show up for rehab. Um, we are, the timing, those folks have been out, you know, we're coming up on a year anniversary of Harvey. Those people, those folks have been in transition for a year now. Um, so, um, and then the other thing is, is that, um, you know, one of the things to think about in terms of 
the local contractors is uh, the homes will be on permanent foundations. So there is work there, um, but it's not the, you know, it, it would be a, a quicker in and out. And the thought is, is that we could cultivate contractors to come in and play that role um, to, to put those homes on permanent foundations. So I just wanted to weigh in on that because time, time is really the factor in that consideration. All right. Well, I see that we are running to the end of our time. An amazing uh, presentation and really want to be able to thank East Central Intergovernmental Association, ECIA, and Kelly, um, the um, Local Initiative Support Corporation, and Suzanne for making both of your time available for our host and sponsor, EIDC. Uh, and for the 100 plus folks or so who are still tuned in to the end of this, thank you very much. We will get answers to questions that we haven't addressed yet um, up on the site. And within 24 hours of today's webinar, an evaluation will be emailed to you by IEDC. If you could please complete it. Uh, they do use your feedback that helped us in preparing this. And at the end of the evaluation, you'll receive the link to get today's presentation. So with that, uh, thank you all for your time and attention to this. And please be in touch with any of the presenters today, myself included, David Lipsetz at the Housing Assistance Council. We look forward to working with you. Thank you.